Welcome to another episode of the Bandage Podcast, a weekly wrap-up of the most trending healthcare news. Each week, join me and my co-host Alex Ross as we'll discuss the latest in healthcare, health IT, and compliance. In this week's episode, we discuss a baby health monitor for low-resource countries, peanut allergy therapy, and California's line for generic drugs. Let's wrap things up. This is episode 49 for the week of September 7th. I'm Matt Moneypenny. And I'm Alex Ross. Before we get started, our diagnosis code of the week is W56.22XA, struck by Orca initial encounter. You know, interestingly enough, this has actually yes. happened to me. Oh. Yeah, it, it has. It, it sounds strange because it seems so oddly specific as if there's no one who's ever actually been diagnosed by this, but whoever was writing the codes was watching a little too much of the SeaWorld live stream at the time. Ah. But it, I'm glad they did because actually it happened to me and um, it, there's a big difference between being struck by a shark and being struck by an orca because sharks yes. are typically very sharp. You know, when they strike you, uh, it cuts and tears. Uh, whereas an orca, when it strikes you, is really like a blunt force trauma. Mm -hmm. and, and that's mm -hmm. exactly how it went. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to film a music video wearing a fish costume <laughs> at SeaWorld. Where is and, this going? <laughs> um, well, you know, if you don't know, when they train orcas at SeaWorld, they use fish as the reward. Um, so during the initial part of my music video... I jumped into the water, flopping around like a fish, and was immediately knocked back out of the tank by the nose of an orca who quickly realized that I wasn't actually a fish, but was already moving too fast uh, to stop well, itself. So, <laughs> What if they weren't trying to hurt you or eat you, and instead they were also musical whales? And you know what musical whales are called, right? An orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, let's get right into the news. First up, we have... Not all baby shoes are useless. A new wearable health monitor empowers parents in low-resource countries to monitor the health of their newborns by providing a low-cost, durable device. The device is shaped like a strap-on shoe. It comes with an on-off switch, which gets triggered as soon as the shoe is worn. The straps and case include sensors that monitor the health of the baby. The device is non-intrusive and communicates an appropriate sense of urgency when necessary. The features were designed so that the device could run in conditions without access to electricity for the full neonatal period of 28 days. After the 28 days, the device is returned, cleaned, and recharged to be used by another newborn. Huh. Baby shoes. New smart device. Every smart week we have a new smart device. Baby. This year, it's baby shoes. Who would have thought? Gonna have, we're going to have to create a new segment in this podcast. Where it's, <laughs> it's just like wearables. Smart device news. <laughs> True. What what is new in terms of because we've talked about toothbrushes and watches and patches and now baby shoes and oh my dear goodness I'm gonna lose track of how many wearables there are. Do you think but, we'll get to a point where the smart baby shoe will help them walk faster? Like as soon as they're like they're like one hour old, <laughs> strap those shoes on, they're running miles. <laughs> I sure hope not because I don't <laughs> think parents are ready for that. Uh, <laughs> you know, part of the most like risky time in a baby's life is that first 28 days, that first period where the parents are just learning what they need to do. Um, it's, it's very vulnerable at that age. So this yes. device kind of, I, I don't know if I were a new parent, I think that would provide me some level of comfort knowing that this device is monitoring health and, you know, the chance of me missing some warning sign is diminished so significantly. Yes. Well, here's a little uh, dark statistic for you, but kind of the reason why this exists is across the globe in 2018, 2.5 million babies died within their first month of life. Collectively, Africa and Southern, Southern Asia made up approximately 87% of those deaths. So that's why this exists. And it looks like a little sandal. <laughs> 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 it's kind of sweet. Pardon I want me. some in real life. <laughs> yeah, I want one for myself. Think about it, though. Insoles that are smart, that seems so much less intrusive than like a wristwatch. And if you're just I know it really does, yeah, actually putting it in the shoe sounds like a great idea. But <laughs> I guess in this case, I really like this idea. I like this device. And it sounds like something that 
you wouldn't necessarily have to purchase. Like it's going to be available to new parents regardless of your circumstance. Maybe it's built. The to thing is with it is the bottom of the sole. I mean, it looks like a shoe, right? But the bottom is where you control it with like buttons mm-hmm. and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if it can like take a hit or like, you know what I mean? Like what if the babies, I mean, they're not necessarily going to be in like a nice air conditioned house. You know what I mean? They're going to be like, in deserts and stuff. So I'm trying to figure out like, can it take a little bit of sand or can it take some wear and tear? I don't really know. Well, I sure hope that the parents are being as responsible as possible and keeping the baby and therefore the device out of very, but I feel like, I mean, at a certain point, it's just kind of the environment around them. There's not much they can do regardless of the parent care. Sure. I don't know. I don't know. Kind of cool though. Kind of cool. Next up, you can stop reading the, quote, may contain peanuts warning when eating your chocolate. Nestle, the world's largest food manufacturer, is building its health science business. This division is involved in areas such as pediatric health, acute care, oncology, healthy aging, gastrointestinal health, and most recently, allergy. Its addition of A-immune therapeutics will boost its focus on dietary management. This biopharmaceutical makes a therapy designed to help children reduce their allergic reactions to peanuts by exposing them to small but increasing amounts of the legume. Nestle's move into peanut allergy treatments is centered on making a person feel better. If more people don't have to worry about consuming a small amount of peanuts by accident, it could put their overall state of mind at ease when eating and looking for safe foods to eat. This is like the opposite of cold turkey. (laughs) Instead of like weaning yourself off of it little by little, it's giving yourself some of it more by more. So it's warm turkey. We can call this hot ham. (laughs) Hot ham or warm turkey approach. (laughs) I mean, that's cool. I just I thought that might it might be a little bit more scientific trying to get people to build up an immune to peanut allergies but i guess not it's just like hey you just gotta have a little bit here and there and then magically your body will build up a resistance to it this sounds a little bit dangerous but i like the way they're right. going with it I, <clears throat> I know i would have a much more sad life if i was not able to eat peanuts i love peanut butter and peanuts and Reese cups well everything has peanuts stuff, so. or some process of peanut oil or something like that right. almost it's almost like corn syrup you know I got a true story for you, and actually this one is legitimately true. When I was in eighth grade... I hope it's not overwhelming. (laughs) No. When I was in eighth grade, I had a friend who had a severe peanut allergy. And Mm -hmm. this one day, my friend is sitting at the lunchroom table, just kind of staring off into space. And I kid you not, he kind of looks around at us and he goes, I can't take it anymore. I have to know. And he pulls a Reese cup out of his pocket, eats it. (laughs) And then pulls his EpiPen out of his pocket and proceeds to stab himself in the leg <laughs> and then up to go get a teacher because obviously now he needs treatment. And I just, it was the most ridiculous I, thing I've ever witnessed. I can't take it anymore. I need to know what a Reese's cup tastes like. Don't do that. Jeez. That is the wrong way to wean yourself <laughs> onto it. That's the most ridiculous story I've ever heard. <laughs> oh man, he like looks around like he's got some paraphernalia and it's just a Reese's cup. <laughs> he's like, oh shit. <laughs> Thankfully, he was fine. They they called a paramedic and it, but it's probably also that. before EpiPens cost like two grand a piece. It was, it was <laughs> <laughs> the most don't expensive Reese's cup of all time. Yep. So in the future, um, just do the therapy and um, you get to experience peanuts in very, very tiny amounts uh, yes. so that you can then experience a little bit more. Next up, California state line of drugs has a new meaning. California is on track to become the first state to develop its own line of generic drugs, targeting soaring drug prices and stepping into a competitive drug market. The legislature approved a measure that would direct the state's top health agency to partner with drug companies to make or distribute a broad range of generic or biosimilar drugs. The bill also opens up the door for California to make its own generic drugs in the future. The goal is for the state to bring drug prices down and it creates a model to address drug shortages and other supply chain issues. This is good. Very good. It's a different take on combating drug prices, right? Because usually 
we're trying to legislate it from the other side. You know, yeah. let's take the people who exist. And but this is almost like, you know, oddly enough for California, a very capitalist approach to it. You know what? Yeah. If you're going to charge so much, we're going to make an alternative and it's going to be cheaper. Yeah. And theoretically, that'll bring down the prices for everybody. But, you know, even mm-hmm. still having access to that and and not being a for profit company even you know makes yeah. that more accessible. hopefully i mean obviously a lot of times when unfortunately when government steps in with something like this it's usually very clunky and takes forever and uh isn't very effective so hopefully <laughs> this actually works because it could be really helpful i think especially when like i said epipen prices are up super high and i mean insulin prices are extreme right now and mm-hmm. it's uh it's pretty sad when you read some of the stories about insulin, uh, people taking substitutes for it and things like that. And then obviously it doesn't work because it's not insulin. So right, right. hopefully <clears throat> this ends up working. Well, I mean, costs of everything are up right now. And yeah, th- the other day I needed to go buy a pack of uh, vinyl food service gloves. And I went to the local food service store and they were $16 for a pack of 100 Oh my gosh. And, and considering that I have to use a pair per person I serve, that's 30 cents every time I have to help someone. That's insane. <laughs> insane. Yeah, that's so. ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously because of COVID, but right, I, don't think, right. I don't think insulin shortages, because I think that happened beforehand. But yeah, that is crazy. I'm imagining, though, that the, the supply chain in general is just really disruptive right now. Um, with manufacturers kind of switching and moving around production, trying to figure out how to supply the things we need for the pandemic while also maintaining manufacturing of the other supplies. So yeah, it's all linked. It's It all goes hand in hand. And with that, let's go into our next segment. B-R-E-A-C-H, Breach Patrol. It's a breach! All of the latest cybersecurity breaches. Welcome to Breach Patrol. We talk about the latest cybersecurity breaches all across the world. First up, we have our first story today is a wicked scam. The e-commerce arm of payment giant Paytim suffered a data breach, according to the U.S.-based cyber research firm Cybel. Man, these names are getting fun. A hacker group targeted the company's Paytim mall database and is demanding a ransom of cryptocurrency in exchange for the data. According to experts, the group hacks databases of companies under its name, John Wick, offering to help fix bugs in their system. The hackers then gain access through the back door. This breach was tipped off to Cybel from an ex-cartel member of the group. Paytim Mall denied the breach and said that user data is secure. Not sure who to believe on this story. It's funny when hackers come up with creative names for (laughs) what they're doing. (laughs) Because John Wick is obviously a, a, an action movie series, and I don't know, I find that kind of interesting. But I don't know, I don't know why they're denying the breach. I mean, unless it actually doesn't exist. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to believe. Like you said, I don't know. Are they breached? Think, Are they not breached? Do you think that there is a potential business in fake breaches? Yes, and that's like, called white hat hack. White hat hacking. No, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, a <laughs> hacker group sending a message to a company saying, hey, we hacked you and we have all your data. Pay us or else, even though they haven't hacked them at all. Oh, do you, I was I thinking think, maybe they, they hack them and then say, hey, we prove that you can be hacked. Pay us money and we'll fix it for you. Right. Right. That's that's something that happens, obviously. But just threatening I'm them just like hey. a hacker group that just pretends to hack people, but never actually does. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> A con man, a con man mm-hmm. hacking group. I mean, there's probably a play there. It's kind of like a phishing attempt, right? Because phishing attempts will be like, we've planted a bomb in your headquarters and you have five minutes to defuse it. Otherwise, you need to give me e- e-commerce, you know, blockchain currency for $50,000. And then it's like, what? And it's always <laughs> broken English. So, I mean, it's kind of similar to that. I will say that ever since the the lockdowns have started, the number of spam calls I've been getting has gone down significantly. So that's kind of silver lining, if you will. Next up, no need to show your ID when it's already been exposed on the Internet. Personal information of thousands of New South Wales motorists 
may have been exposed in a mysterious online data leak. The breach was discovered by a Europe-based cyber threat consultant who was investigating a separate breach. He discovered a folder containing 108,000 scanned images of driver's licenses and another containing toll notices. The data could have come from a wide range of sources since many companies require a driver's license as proof of identification. But toll notices within the leak suggest that it's likely a toll operator. The average person would have been unlikely to locate the exposed files. The data has since been secured, but the source of the upload files is unknown. It's believed that these affected by the breach are yet to be contacted. I hate to say it, but driver's license information is typically public, right? Yeah, I don't. that's not that big of a deal. Maybe it's different in Europe. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's why it's such a big deal. Um, but yeah, usually that stuff is kind of public information regardless, considering it's a widely used and accepted ID (laughs) by everybody. So, um, and if your company can use it to verify identity, then, you know, yeah, I I guess the, the challenge here is that it's a picture of a driver's license. So theoretically it could be kind of reproduced in a sense so that someone could fake given to someone like a, uh, like a Jason Bourne. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> first John Wick, now Jason Bourne. <laughs> yeah, oh, a- an action-packed podcast today, if you will. Oh, absolutely. I, I get, yeah, I guess that's the threat is that the the licenses kind of contain pictures and everything. So if you wanted to fake an identity, yeah, but they also have those holographic embeds within them. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> ours do i don't know about new South. yeah i don't know it's hard to, to figure out what the big deal is here from the united states standpoint now that i'm thinking about it new south wales is actually in australia ah. <laughs> but then it, it says europe based right it was discovered by the the europe based consultant That's wild so even so regardless i mean isn't australia and europe the exact same <laughs> 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 Might as well be. (laughs) (laughs) Next up, online schooling draws threats. Hackers breached three servers and a storage workstation of Greenville Technical College. They exploited a vulnerability in the virtual private network and encrypted data to hold for ransom. A spokesperson from the college said they were able to delete the encrypted data and reload it from clean backups. No personal information was affected. But hackers claim otherwise, saying that they obtain social security and driver's license numbers, and they're threatening to sell it on the dark web unless Greenville Tech contacts them. The college contacted the FBI and continues to analyze the severity and impact of the breach. Greenville Tech's virtual private network remains offline. Students who are taking online courses do not use this network. Ransomware, the hottest trend in hacking. Like, well, here's one way to combat it. Have backups. backups have backups and then contact the FBI like you're supposed to. Exactly. This seems to be... It's a pretty good response. Yeah. Right. In a, well, in a good way. Especially considering it's a technical college. And if you're following, like, you know, the, the stereotypical technical college or anything like that, they're usually, like, a little bit, you know, behind the times. And um, they're, I mean, they're not really, they don't, they're not... They're not as well uh, versed as obviously like a state college or a private college because it's a technical college. But apparently Greenville Technical College has their stuff on lock. So Right. So here's a lesson you can take from this that you have to, to make some of these adjustments to your current structure so that if this were to happen to you, and it's really not a matter of if, it's when at this point that you have kind of those those backups, right? You don't have to pay a ransom if you can just back up to the the same files that were, you know, an hour ago. You yep. might lose a little bit, but it's better than losing hundreds of thousands of dollars either through a ransom or, you know, in that investigation and negotiation and trying to recoup that data. Um, so make backups. Put them in back secure up. Boxes. That's the other thing. You can't back it up into a less secure format. (laughs) In the words of the very famous uh, cybersecurity expert, Lil John, back, back, back it up. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I'm calling it. That's it for this week's wrap up of your weekly healthcare news. I'm Alex Ross. And I'm Matt Moneypenny. And we will see you next week. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of The Bandage. 
This week's episode was written and produced by eTactics. eTactics is a leading revenue cycle solutions organization committed to providing innovative, web-based solutions that improve our clients' cash management and customer relationships. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.